Hi all, my name is Kylie Baker and I'm talking to you from Queensland. I hope you don't mind if there's a little bit of thunder in the background, it's storm season here. I must extend great gratitude to Dr. Peter Van Sharma for actually inviting me to do this talk. He knows how much I love to sit on my soapbook box and, and preach the good pocus word. Anyway, I think you folk do things a little differently to we do down across the pond. So I start my slide with my conflict, or as I call them, confluences of interest um, at the side here. Everything I do is to try and get things a little bit more smooth at Ipswich Hospital. I've had some marvellous research grants from the Emergency Medicine Foundation and I practice my ultrasound teaching at the Australian Institute of Ultrasound. Most importantly, uh, my life is being taken up with my granddaughter and she's getting bigger while everything else is shrinking. Anyway, I hope that uh, this talk will be very easy for you because what we're talking about is something you already know. You've learned since medical school how to recognize processes. And so all I have to do with gut ultrasound is introduce you to a couple of patterns and you put them into the old paradigms that you're already very familiar with. Now this isn't new. Um, you folk have been doing it intensive care for a little while now, although intensive care is more about monitoring a patient and ED, for me, the question for example is, do I need to get a CT? A little bit harder to get CTs in Australia than your side of the ocean. Anyways, um, it's also something that the gastroenterologists in Europe have been doing for years and so they've already put out some very good and informative guidelines and um, the World Journal of Gastroenterology has some very nice baselines. However, you must remember that they're gastroenterologists and so they do start from the tail end first and um, they're more interested in inflammatory bowel disease. But we're going for at least five years now. I would like to start somewhere you're already somewhat familiar. The reason I'd like to start with talking about appendix is that everything you learn from doing appendixes can then be uh, stretched further around. Sorry, the dogs are a bit, <laughs> a bit scared of the thunderstorms. Can, can stretch further around and is just as pertinent to the rest of the bowel. So let's revise appendix and then we'll spread outwards. Now obviously when the appendix is really obvious, when um, the patient jumps, when you breathe over the McBurney's point, you don't need an ultrasound. Ultrasound is more important for the slightly trickier presentations. And I'd like by the end of this day for you to have some concept of how to locate a normal appendix, how to notice it and follow it, um, and not be so scared of all the bodgy grey and white lines you see in a picture like this. So just revising, those on the left are what you expect to see in a normal appendix. At least five layers, um, something that compresses to oval, and if it has white gas in the middle of it or even a white fecalith that compresses, we're not worried. But those pictures on the, on the right hand of the side are more concerning. They're bigger, they're more bold. If we lose the delineation such as the middle one where all we see is grey in the middle, we get worried about necrosis or gangrene. And the one at the bottom with the flower in the middle isn't appendix at all, even though it's in the right spot and the right size. That's what terminal ileum looks like. So those on the left of the screen, that's what we're after. Those on the right, not so much. Now remember the normal appendix is sapiginous. It sort of curls around in the right iliac fossa in any direction it feels like. So a normal appendix will often be seen in many different cross sections. Now, I'm not really, really in favour of asking the patient to point where it hurts most and putting the probe there. I mean, if the patient can do that, you don't need to put the probe there in general. I also do a bit of paediatrics, so I'm quite used to sneaking up on the sore bit. I start away from the, the pain and gradually circle down. In fact, my favourite place to start is with a big curved linear probe suprapubically. I think it's really important to make sure you don't have a nasty forest before you go hunting for the individual trees. So I like to look for free fluid. I like to see if it's dark and if it's maximum in the pelvis. From here, 
I do what Roger Ghent, he's an Australian sonographer, describes. I put the probe very low on the E8 vessels, even beneath the abdominal cavity, and I slide the probe gradually north until I see this. This is a little bit of valve just crossing over the top of the E8 vessels. This will be the terminal ileum, and I'm going to use that as a handhold to climb my way forwards towards the um, appendix. The good thing about this is that you'll see anything under the orange line is retroperitoneal. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to search in there. Furthermore, everything above the second orange line is abdominal wall, so we don't have to search above there. And so, in fact, the area of interest is actually quite narrow. And that's useful because it makes it easier to search. Once I've found the terminal ileum, I slide the probe in transverse across to the right iliac fossa. And I'm looking for this picture on the left. I'm looking for a fluffy white cloud that slides just underneath the abdominal musculature. Because cecum usually has um, gas in it. And I would never go looking for the appendix if I hadn't first identified the cecum. Because you can spend a heck of a lot of time looking in the wrong place. Once I found what I think is the end of the ascending colon, the cecum, I turn the probe 90 degrees, this isn't my best of pictures, and I watch it slide up and down on the iliocellus. You'll often see that there's a tiny little uh, triangle of fluid at the end of the cecum. And again, we're only having to look in this area. It's a bit easier. Okay, so now it's time to look for the trees. Now that I've delineated the forest, I'm going to change to the straight probe. I'm going to hold the um, cecum on my left, terminal ileum's there at the top, and the iliosoas is there to the bottom right. And lo and behold, this time we strike it lucky, there's a little round target lesion between the three. Now you've got to just stop and admire it first. You've got to watch and see that it doesn't peristalse. And then you should follow it for a little while. It's actually important that you prove it doesn't um, peristalse and you've got to prove that it's actually blind ending. It's not enough just to find what you think is the appendix. Then we need to turn on it because nothing exists unless you show it in two planes. And um, we can often find it nice and clear like this if we gently increase the pressure. We call it graded pressure and we're gradually pushing the bowel gas away. This particular one we can see it's sitting on the iliopsoas and it's even got a little fecal lip in the end. Now it is important that you demonstrate it in two planes like this. We've got a linear structure on the left, we've got a little compressible oval on the right. We want to measure it, AP, uh, under compression. Now it's critical that you do this because as you can see Terminal ileum can look the same in long. And it's only when you turn in transverse that you see it's not quite round and it actually has a sort of flower in the middle. Now, the next question is where you start to look. And one of my favourite um, signposts is uh, sentinel loop. They, they exist in ultrasound just as much as they exist in x ray. So when I see a loop of bowel that has a little bit extra fluid in it, is not peristalsing as happily as normal, I look nearby and underneath. If I find an area of bright fat, that's a marvellous giveaway. Bright fat is the same as you would uh, see on CT when they talk about fat stranding. Um, I think it's the inflamed cells in the mesentery that cause more scatter. When you push down, it becomes even more dense. And that's what gives rise to this sign of what we've described as the thyroid in the abdomen because you see the edematous um, appendix becomes hypoechoic at the same time as the surrounding mesentery becomes hyperechoic. Anyways, if you see something like this, this is inflamed cecum, it's a sign that you have to search nearby carefully. Now, inflamed cecum's a uh, two-edged sword. It could be primarily the cause of your right iliac fossa pain if, for example, the patient has Campylobacter or Yersinia, or it could be secondary, it could be due to the inflammation spreading from appendicitis. So if you do find something like this, you're duty-bound to keep chasing the appendix. 
And finally, I like to look for areas that don't move, particularly don't move when you compress them or push down. You can see in the near field on this picture, there's some very active terminal ileum. But halfway down the screen, right in the middle, there's an area of bright fat and a circular area that doesn't compress. In fact, as you push on it, it simply moves deeper but maintains its shape. This is your classic deep appendix type picture. Now these pockets of fluids are very useful. I don't call them precisely free fluid because they don't gravitate down to the lowest areas. They'll often stay wrapped in areas of bowel. But they're another sign that we have perhaps micro perforations or even full-blown perforations. So here we have a nice normal appendix on the left squashing to oblong. It's really important that we follow it to the tip because on the right we actually have the same appendix but as you can see it's much bigger. We measure it on the left it's 5.5 millimeters but the tip here distally is at least 6.9 that's probably underestimated. Now the official criteria have been for a long time six millimeters as the upper limit of normal. That is a sensitive thing and if you want a specific cutoff you probably move up to eight millimeters and that's AP with compression. It must be a blind ending non-peristalsing tube that's attached to the cecum and hopefully there'll be some supporting signs. In fact it's quite acceptable to um, diagnose appendicitis just on the basis of supporting signs. The supporting signs are ones that I've already alluded to. The bright fats of beauty, it's the same thing as you would expect to see when the CT reports fat stranding. The sentinel loops, one of my personal favorites. Free fluid and cecal inflammation um, are a bit less frequent and they're not specific but useful. Hypervascularity is one that's not so convenient with our point of care machines. I don't think they've quite got the resolution to differentiate between respiratory movement, peristalsis and vasculature, but it doesn't stop them trying. And finally, often quoted are nodes and fecalis, and I'm sorry, but they are not my favourite signs. Uh, we sometimes blame nodes for mesenteric adenitis and fecalis can be found just as easily in, in normal appendixes. Now, I've been scanning appendixes more than 10 years now and my own personal flags are that whatever you're going to call appendix, it's got to be tender. And what's more, it's got to be tender every time you come back to the same spot. I think one of the best things about scanning for appendix is you do a prolonged examination. You distract the patient in a dark room, warm jelly, chitter chatter and a screen to watch. And you can get rid of most of the voluntary guarding. If they're still guarding each time you come back to that blind ending tubular structure, then you know you've struck gold. The other thing is that the increased diameter has to be to wall thickening, not due to hyperechoic contents like gas or fecal. Now, that's appendix. We've revised that. All these things are just as much use to you when you go looking around the rest of the bowel. So we'll do some anatomy first. This is the stomach, like a sock. Uh, this is the small bowel, folded and tangled like stockings always are. And then finally, because I was doing this talk uh, for Montreal initially, and I had to have Ted stockings for the flight over. Anyway, I like Ted stockings as the colon because the colon is usually white. It gives you a white gas shadow. It's important that you consider the anatomy here because the colon is not as consistent as we're led to believe in the, in the textbooks. The ascending colon and the descending colon are supposed to be tethered or retroperitoneal, but they're not always. The uh, mesentery for the transverse colon can be long or short. Likewise, the sigmoid colon can be small or redundant. So it's important to look at what's in front and what tucks behind, because although you can usually tell the difference between healthy small bowel and healthy colon. Once one of them becomes unhealthy, it gets to be a bit harder. Don't forget also there's the mesentery in the middle that sits like a stack of plates. Anyway, 
The first view that I like to get is one that you already know. You already do this left upper quadrant view when you're doing a fast scan. And starting with that usual linorenal angle is just perfect. Go to the tip of the spleen, but when you're there, just fan a little bit posteriorly and look for something like this. Now, please don't call this free fluid. This is actually a vomit just waiting to happen. The next thing you do is look at the pylorus, and this is the view that the anaesthetist scheme really excited about. Again, it's a view that you do all the time when you're looking longitudinally for IVC or aorta. But you just look at a different part of the picture. You look under the edge of the liver and you're looking for that complete dark ring with white stuff in the middle. That's the, the gastric antrum and the pylorus. And what the anaesthetists do is they roll the patient in steep left lateral and then they measure around that um, pyloric antrum or pylorus. And then they put this um, uh, surface area into a very complicated sum and will come up with an estimate of gastric volume. Now this one here would be not too bad, particularly if this is taken in steep left lateral. But if you saw something like this, I mean immediately you'd think that's gallbladder, but watch. Watch how we see a normal gallbladder and then the big hole with lumpy bits follows on beyond the gallbladder. This is a high gut obstruction and that's actually food sitting there in the duodenum. So that's how we scan the stomach. If you really um, need convincing, you can join the dots between one side and the other and a really full stomach will be visible. What you're actually seeing here is a visible succussion splash. Uh, food on the, uh, gas on the left and fluid and food sloshing back and forth on the right. Okay, so that was the stomach. Let's move on to the small bowel. Now you really, most of us don't worry about the duodenum because this area in the right upper quadrant is often obscured by gas. Um, you look for the, um, for the pancreas and you look for the gallbladder, but um, if you actually happen to see some duodenal, something's probably wrong. Now, most of us start back here, we're already pretty familiar, with the left upper quadrant. And um, instead of looking straight at the lower pole of the spleen, where you can see a bit of fluid here, we'll look instead on the inferior pole of the kidney, because this is where you start to see jejunum. And what we want to see is um, loops of bowel that are active and peristalsing with an almost invisible wall and usually heterogeneous mid-level grey contents. And this is nice, healthy, small bowel. And we, we traipse down the left paracolic gutter. We gradually move across suprapubically. This is where we meet the ileum. Uh, the ileum can be distinguished by clever gastroenterologists, but I just don't know where I find it. And then we go right across to the um, right iliac fossa. This is where we're expecting to see terminal ileum. Lovely picture here. Now this whole set of pictures is perhaps a little bit more active than I'd expect. It's the sort of thing you might see in a gastroenterologist. But in all of these pictures, the wall is thin, caliber is less than a couple of centimeters and it's active. Peristalsis is a sign of health. Last century we used to talk about libido as a sign of health but this century we say peristalsis is a sign of health. Now you never forget that. Okay time to get on to the third part of the scan and that's the colon. I call the next few 6b because it's actually the same one as we have for the terminal ileum. you just rock the probe a little bit. What we're expecting to see now is a gas interface. It's a bit like lung. We're not actually expecting to see beyond the gas. In fact, if you can see the far wall of the colon, you start to get worried. A normal gas shadow like this one in long has intervals, little breaks where the haustra are. If we want to, we can follow the whole colon round, but most of us have not got that much time and we just sample intermittently. This is a view further up. You can see a bit of kidney in the picture. But this one's not so happy. This is still got the haustra, but it's fluid filled. This one, in fact, is um, an ileus. Moving right along, 
you get a little bit worried if the leading edge is very tight and broad and loses the halster. This would be gaseous distension here. And then finally, um, we might want to turn 90 degrees on the bowel if we've got a lot of time and even measure the distance of the arc because it gives you an idea of the caliber or the, the, the breadth of the distension. Last but not least, we look through the bladder at the rectum. And again, we can get an idea of how full the rectum is by how wide is that bright white concave downward arc. Now I can't promise you that that is faeces. It could be just air, but the likelihood that it is a large cricket ball of hard poo is very high. So this one here, bottom left, is normal. But the other four are all a bit abnormal. Now, the rest is easy. The rest is just about putting the patterns into patterns you already recognise. So, for example, on a CT, when you're looking for free gas, you look at the high points. When you're looking for free fluid, you look down at the low points. If you're looking for obstruction or ileus, um, and it's very hard to tell the difference between obstruction and ileus, we can talk about that later, you look for how big the, um, the tubes have been dilated. And finally, we want to look at the actual thickening of the bowel wall. Oh, and then finally, finally, we want to look and see if there's any spreading inflammation out beyond the wall itself. Inflammation of mesentery, fat stranding, essentially. And then as you recognize the patterns, you then map the distribution in your head. Because again, this is something you're used to. You ask yourself, is there a transition point like at a hernial orifice? Or you ask yourself, is it spreading out from one source, like the right iliac fossa or the left iliac fossa? And then you ask yourself, is it patchy, like Crohn's disease? Or is it contiguous, like a, a colitis or an ischemic colitis? And that's how you um, identify the pattern. It's not that you see something in, that says immediately to you, aha, that is ischemic colitis. No. It's very simple, sensitive, non-specific signs, just like lung ultrasound really, that you tie together looking for the pattern of the patterns. Now, I hope I'm not going too fast. I'm wary of the time. We do have some random facts. The first thing is that the pylorus has the only normally complete bowel wall that you see easily with the curved probe. So if you see that dark ring up under the liver edge, you don't panic. But if you see it anywhere else in the abdomen, you've got to come back for a second look. The resolution of your curved abdominal probe doesn't usually see something that's less than two millimeters. If you see it, then it's probably a little bit thickened. The second thing is that the gut wall itself should be less than three millimeters thick anywhere along. Now the gastroenterologists from Europe tell us that we want to measure from the outermost dark edge to the innermost dark edge. And that's because the, the white line that we see outside and inside, in both instances, is a composite shadow. Um, imagine it being like the visceral pleura rubbing the parietal pleura in the lungs. You can't tell where one finishes and the other starts. So, for the sake of human uniformity, we're told to measure dark edge to dark edge. Now, normal small bowel has lots of movement but not much gas. Uh, it peristalsis anything from 3 to 10 times per minute, less as you get towards the terminal ileum. Colon, on the other hand, has a lot of gas and not much movement. Uh, if you see sort of a constricted area in the colon, all you do is come back a minute later and see if it's still there. Finally, easy to remember, but not very sensitive, is the 369 rule. 3 means the small bowel caliber. If it's more than 3 centimeters, it's probably dilated. 6 is the colon. If it's more than six centimeters wide, it's probably dilated. And nine is for the cecum. So the cecum can get a bit more full than anywhere else.
Now, if you're a really good gastroenterologist, you might want to take theirs back a bit, say 2.5 centimeters. But for me, as an emergency physician with a point of care machine, I stick with the 369. Okay, I'm going to run through um, some cases now. I hope we're not too fast. I'm recording this so that for those of you who find my accent too tricky, you can listen to it again later. We're going to start with an 89-year-old patient from a nursing home who's on an ambulance ramping area. She's been there all morning. They've sent her in because she hasn't been eating for a week. The doctor's given her some new panadine fort, that's um, acetaminophen with a fair dose of codeine in it for her back pain. But she's always had chronic nausea. In fact, she had an MRCP a few weeks back for the same thing. And what we're wondering is, do we need to pull her off the stretcher and investigate her further, or can we simply blame the, um, the panadine port? Okay, let's start with the stomach, that left upper quadrant view, where we're expecting to see the spleen. And uh, instead, we see this sort of swirling, starry sky. Okay, red flags up immediately. Let's go down and look at the pylorus. No, that's not the pylorus. We're actually looking at the gallbladder there proof that she hasn't eaten for a while. And we're not seeing anything that's distinctly pylorus. Hmm. Let's join these two dots. And, whoa, that's this picture. This is a patient who has the visible succussion splash. So we're not imagining. This is a very full stomach. So we did offload this patient, and, in fact, we got a CT. And, surprisingly, the CT was reported as normal. Now, that's not the radiologist's fault. That's our fault because we didn't say that this patient's been starved all day. And so they interpreted the full stomach and the um, sort of the, the white bits in the antrum, they interpreted that as food and fluid. She died a day later in the ward. And when we went back to look at the pictures, we realised that this thick, solid bit here was actually present um, several weeks before with her MRCP, and it was a missed mass. Okay, next one, four-year-old boy, vomiting for one day. Seems to probably have colicky pain, and he's a bit pale and drowsy, but his observations are normal, his blood's are normal. We're wondering if he's got gastroenteritis brewing, just not yet the diarrhoea, or if he's got a surgical tummy. Now, this is a big question at our place, because we're only a medium-sized hospital. We can deal with gastroenterologists, gastroenterology in the, in the medical ward, but we can't don't do paediatric surgery so if it is surgical we have to convince the hospital down the road and put him in an ambulance for half an hour. So looking at his stomach, four-year-olds don't hold still terribly well, uh, it looks like there might be a bit of heterogeneous echoes up there where the stomach's supposed to be. So let's go and look at the pylorus and that is not what we expect to see, absolutely not. Okay, um, interestingly, I'll show you right now the um, x-ray of this kitty, and the comment from the radiologist was actually, um, could be an ileus, please look for the appendix. So, okay, we started down the um, left paracolic gutter, and we saw this, which really looks concerning, and going down to the suprapubic view, we see even more of the same. And at, at this point, I kid you not, I was starting to get very anxious. A formal ultrasound didn't show any more. We couldn't find his um, appendix, but we did transfer him to the um, children's hospital where he was found to have a small bowel volvulus around the Meckel's diverticulum. Now, let's keep going. Let's practice some more. This is an older woman. She's had 24 hours of suprapubic colicky pain and a history of a cecal volvulus with a right hemicolectomy. And the question is, mm, is this maybe a subacute bowel obstruction? Can we just sit on her? Um, looking at the left upper quadrant, I'm happy and sad at the same time. I can see a little bit of free flow fluid at the lower pole of the spleen, which is bad. But I can see a little bit of small bowel just above the lower pole of the kidney, and it's not too big. So, mm -hmm. first view, not so bad. However, moving down the left paracolic gutter, I can see an odd, hesitate to call it, but probably transition. I can see thin 
active small bowel on the left of the spring and a big bit on the right. Okay, let's go around further. Left iliac fossa. Ooh, this is definitely worrying. We've got um, dilated bowel. The wall isn't thick yet, so we're not panicking. We're starting to see little bits of um, fluid tucked around the edges. That's a bit of a sign of inflammation or weeping. And over in the right iliac fossa, uh, another big loop doing nothing, going nowhere. Now remember she's had the hemicolectomy, so not going to see this bit. But trying to track her colon on the left side, and there's nothing terribly exciting at all. Not distended, sort of narrow, um, white fluffy cloud. She was observed two days and then taken to OT. It turns out that she had a closed loop obstruction and in the end 70 centimetres of ischemic gut was removed. We learn. We learn. A middle-aged woman, she's had months of anorexia and weight loss, some loose stools, a big history of depression and maybe some subacute bowel obstruction in the past that was thought to be due to adhesions. And, and again, we'll run off our feet and the question is, do we have to sort this lady out today or can we flick her back to her GP? So, putting the probe in the left upper quadrant, immediately we can see that this is not psychosomatic. Okay, slide down the left side. This is what we call keyboard sign, with the contents going backwards and forwards. We can see a little bit of free fluid, another concern for inflammation. Going suprapubically, there is an unholy mess. Of, I don't know what it is, but it seems to have thick bowel wall and it seems to be matted and contracted. And moving across to the right iliac fossa, we've got, we've got two things. We've got sort of distended small bowel uh, at the top and then near field. And then we've got more of that thick walled something deeper to it. And this is why I say it can be very hard to determine large bowel from small bowel uh, when they're pathological. Now the reason I've shown you this is I want to point out how similar our ultrasound findings are to the CT. As you can see, she has distended fluid filled bowel on her left and her right. She has a matted tangled mass in the middle, the thick wall which we saw. And we even saw on the, uh, whoops, on the right we saw the thick, here we go, um, thick area of bowel deep and then the thin distended loop above it. Turns out she had Crohn's disease but we didn't diagnose it for another 18 months or so because uh, we don't actually have gastroenterologists at our hospital at this time. Another one, young woman, sepsis and vomiting. Now we're not sure if she's just got gastroenteritis or if this is the, the hallmark of a, of a larger disease. She hasn't had any diarrhea yet and her only history is of IBDU. And again, we're wondering, should we be doing a CT of her tummy? Now, I think in Australia, we're probably a lot more reticent about abdominal CTs, particularly in young women. They almost always get some sort of formal ultrasound first. But it's a bit of a catch-22 because most of our sonographers are not comfortable scanning bowel. So, left upper quadrant, let's see what it looks like. This is already quite different to the ones we've seen before, isn't it? So the small bowel isn't actually dilated or distended, but the wall is very thick. Not only that, the surrounding mesentery is quite bright. So we've got a transmural process that seems to even be leaking or affecting the outside. As we move down, it's, well, pretty much the same thing. There's not much peristalsis in it. Remember I said peristalsis is a sign of health. Well, this isn't. And further down, suprapubically, still more of the same. No good peristalsis. Now, when you ever see um, thick wall bowel, my first instinct is to go and look at the vascular supply because your, um, both your arterial and your venous ischemias will cause thickening of the bowel wall at slightly different stages. Hers seem to have quite a very uh, prominent SMA. 
The other thing that you can do is put the colour flow over the bowel itself. And this isn't so easy with our point of care machines, but in general, you don't see vascularity of the bowel wall, it's too fine. So when you do see vessels like this one, it tends to mean that the bowel's hyperemic. Something we've got to work on, I think. Um, I'd dearly love to be able to pick ischemic bowel reliably. Any rate, I'd like to show you her CT because again, it corresponds pretty closely to what we were seeing. If you look right down her left paracolic gutter, there's that thick walled, shaggy small bowel. It isn't particularly distended. And as we cross across to the right, we have more fluid and less gas. She was actually diagnosed by the CT radiographers boldly as having enteritis, but that's how she was managed. She had IV fluids and antibiotics under the medical team and she got diarrhea and then she got better. We never tracked her blood work. Okay, getting to the men. Middle-aged man, 24 hours of severe colicky abdo pain. Now he's got a bit of a vague history. He thinks he might have lactose intolerance. He thinks he's got some sort of autoimmune disease because he sees a rheumatologist, but he knows he's got diverticular disease and recently he's had a bit of melina. Anyways, when he gets to us, he's tachycardic, he's febrile, and he's frankly peritonitic. So have a quick look, and um, I mean, while I'm trying to find the, um, the um, pylorus, I see this instead. This is transverse across the top of the stomach. If you look carefully, you'll notice that we have a pneumothorax in the abdomen. We've got free gas, essentially. Now, that's no particular surprise, being that he's quite peritonitic. As we start looking down the left paracolic gutter, same as the last lady, isn't it? We, the to and fro stool contents and the piano keyboard song. As so we drift down into the left iliac fossa, they look initially like um, big loops of bowel, but they're actually round in both directions. Be wary in that um, large reactive lymph nodes can be quite hypoechoic, and unless you put the colour flow on, unless you're actually suspicious, you might miss the feeder vessel. So this patient has some very large lymph nodes. And finally, suprapubically, we come across a segment not just with the small bowel, but a little bit here, which is absolutely classic diverticular disease. Diverticulitis causes hypertrophy of the outermost muscularis, and muscle is generally hypoechoic, so that means we get that thick, dark outline. It squeezes down, so the contents become bright and uh, knobbly, and then because it's inflamed, if it's actually diverticulitis, the mesentery on the outside becomes bright, so it tends to stand out as a bright, dark, bright pattern. What's more, it will be tender. And then finally, got across to the right iliac fossa, and we saw a bit of uh, free fluid here. Little pockets of free fluid, always a look. And just so as you know, just so you realise, we found all the things that the, gut, uh, the um, CT found. In, in fact, we actually found more. We saw the whoops, we saw the free gas at the top of the liver. We saw the very large lymph node here in the right groin. We saw this bit of matted diverticular disease with thick bowel wall and fat stranding around it. Could have been that bit. And we saw this loop of ileus, sentinel loop nearby. He did have a perforated diverticulum, but he was diagnosed uh, many months later with the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I think, I still to this day think um, inflammatory bowel disease. Now, simple diverticulitis, though, diverticulitis is quite uh, easy. It's tender. It has this thick muscularis around the outside. And if you line it up very carefully, you can even see the little diverticulum sometimes breaking through the muscular layer. If you haven't got a, a nice view with a straight probe, with the curvy linear probe, you may simply see this pattern on the right, the dark circle surrounded by dense fat. And it's tender. If it's not tender, think is it a cancer. I'd like to go back just briefly to that free gas because free gas isn't as easy as you'd assume it to be. 
being that um, on the liver, the, the lung may slide down in front of the liver. But if you look very carefully on this picture on the left, you'll see that there's this thin wall of diaphragm that's separating the free fluid and the sliding lung. And see how the lung slides with respiration. Look across on this picture on the right, same patient in fact, where we have the free gas actually in this portion of uh, fluid here. And there is no line of diaphragm separating the two. I don't tend to call um, free gas anywhere except over a solid organ or if I can roll them round because it is a bit deceptive. Really tense, distended gut filled with gas can look very similar. It does move differently too. Okay, let's move because we can't afford to miss this one to an 18 month old with episodic abdominal pain and mum says it's just like the last time he had intersusception. That's easy. So we put the probe right where the high yield spot is down the iliocolic junction and sure enough we see this big lumpy bit. Now an iliocolic intersusception with a curved abdominal probe really does look surprisingly like a kidney because the central part is hyperechoic and the outer part is hypoechoic. In cross-section it looks like a round thing and if you're good enough to get a straight probe on you can see that the hyperechoic center actually has lamella or layers on Mike on the right. Now iliocolic intersusception is big. It'll be bigger than three centimeters in diameter and long have bits of fat and fluid in it. However, small bowel intersusceptions are small ileo-ileal ones. They'll be less than two and a half centimeters in diameter. They're usually ignored by sonographers because they're so common they come and go during a scan. I myself think that they probably do cause intermittent symptoms. I suspect that they're the cause of a lot of um, nebulous abdominal pain that we put down to mesenteric adenitis. And they are worse. They can occasionally cause genuine trouble if they're caused by some sort of nidus, like a polyp or a node. In fact, if you lived in one of the um, more austere countries where they have a lot of inflammatory infectious bowel disease, they will, in fact, admit these patients and observe them until it settles down, possibly with serial ultrasounds. Because just occasionally, these can cause a genuine obstruction. They look beautiful. Uh, here's one in transverse section. You can see it peristalsing away. Looks grand, but that's only because this is a very slim little patient. And on the right, you can see it in longitudinal, a bit like a stack of pancakes, peristalsing happily. Now, an older man with abdominal pain and obstipation gradually increasing over the months passing pencil-like stool. Looking in his left upper quadrant, ugh, can't see the stomach at all. All I see is this gas edge. Looking for the pylorus, ugh, all I see is this strange thing that appears to be part gas and part heterogeneous fluid. Okay, not happy. Definitely something serious going on. Now looking in his left um, loin, I'm temporarily relieved because I can see a little bit of normal small bowel. It's peristalsing, it doesn't have much of an advanced wall, and it's not dilated. So there's a bit of his bowel working normally. But as we track further down, mm, it does become a bit distended here, hyperactive perhaps. They talk about obstructions having hyperactive peristalsis proximal, but that does go away after a while. Anyway, suprapubically, we can see the pubic symphysis there, and we can see again that large speckly mass. When we go to the right upper quadrant, we can see more of the large speckledy mass sitting above the kidney. And just to the right, we do see what's probably a bit of normal small bowel. Heaven knows which bit, though. We can measure this big speckledy mass and it's very large. It's probably seven centimetres. 
while we're looking at the right upper quadrant we see that there's some free fluid and there's well even a mass in the liver a very large mass the rectum is almost impossible to see so what we were looking at and again I'm showing you the CT so that you can see the correlation between what we find on ultrasound and CT you can see this big mass of feces in the ascending colon you can see on the right picture, we can see this big metastasis in the liver. And you can see that it went right the way down to the rectum, and it was a stricturing rectal carcinoma in this case. Now, cancers, we do find them. They can look remarkably like the picture on the CT. Um, this one was not obstructing, it was one of those um, covert sequel carcinomas. Um, whoops, wrong way, sorry. And it has a good vascular supply. Whenever the wall of the colon, particularly the colon, is asymmetrically thickened, non tender, we must be very worried. Here's another one. Here on the left, we have right in the middle of the screen the apple core picture. It corresponds to the bit of the arrow on the CT beside it, where we've got that very narrow bubble of gas. And the darkness on each side of the narrow waist is the thickened um, bowel wall. We've got fluid on the left of the picture and gas on the right. In fact, when we turn 90 degrees at that very waist, we can see the asymmetrical thickening of the wall of the colon in this, this particular spot. And finally, forgive me for racing, but I'm wary of time. We have an elderly patient who has hypotension, acute on chronic abdominal pain, no one's found the cause for it, and occasionally blood in the stool. So let's start with the small bowel. It's not too bad. It's moving a bit. It's not big. We don't have a thick bleeding edge. Happy. Move down into the right iliac fossa and suddenly something doesn't look right. You don't normally see through bowel like this. And if you do, it should be peristalsis. You've got a very thin trickle of mucosa or feces in the middle. Um, but most of this is bowel wall. Now this is a sitter for a colitis. And if it's just restricted to the descending colon, you've got to seriously think about ischemic colitis. It's chronic ischemia, not acute ischemia. We follow it down and around, and again, I'm trying really hard to see if it's got flow in it. If this was an infectious colitis, it would be more likely to have visible flow, but not this one. What we do try and do is follow it right down to the rectum, because as you remember, the rectal blood supply is different. Descending colon is inferior mesenteric artery, but rectal blood supply is something else, I forgot which. And in this particular case, it appeared to settle down. Hard to tell, though, because it's diving deep into the pox. Whenever you see segmental wall thickening like this, you must be very concerned or worried for ischemic colitis. I would automatically have a little look at the aorta and see what sort of nick it's in. And if I possibly can, have a better look at the heart to see if it's generating adequate blood supply. In summary, this isn't rocket science. You've already been doing most of this already when you look at CTs. You've been looking for patterns. All I've done is shown you half a dozen signs, basically even extrapolated the ones you know from appendicitis, and ask you to think about the pattern of the patterns. I'm asking you to try and figure out, is there a transition point? like at a hernial orifice? Is it something that's slow or sudden, like your torsions? Is it regional, like something that spreads out from the, the right iliac fossa or the left iliac fossa? Or is it something that's a patchy process with bits of normality in between, like Crohn's disease? Now that's all the information you need to know and your only limitations now are going to be how much time you spend on them. Please, please start paying attention to the bowel, because it's only by calibrating your eye to the normal 
that you'll start to pick up the abnormal. And thank you again. Thank you very much from Queensland, Australia. Uh, night time. Please forgive the dogs that were scared of the thunderstorm and my husband testing smoke alarms. Uh, hope to put this on YouTube sometime in case anyone wants to watch it again. Bye-bye.